morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp. I have a guest on here today. It's Hayden um, Groats, and she's here to talk about Bike for Shelter. I'll hear her talk about that in a little bit more later in the show. I got a lot of news. I got a lot of city council and a lot to get through on your last best morning show. So let's kick things off with some weather. Flood warnings go well into the weekend and into Monday. As you can see, there's that flood advisory happening. Um, you can go to um, nationalweatherservice.gov for more information, but today, 100% chances of showers, which will be lessening and lessening throughout this whole entire weekend, but things will start warming up a little bit more, too, with highs into the 60s, um, lows into the 40s, so things will start to get a little bit warmer, and also weather is somewhat slated to get even hotter later next week so look out for some of the snow runoff besides some of the rain that's falling on here and also with more weather taking more of the rain um, if you want more information about uh, shelters because a lot of places um, in the Missoula area have been uh, evacuated about 820 homes are now under evacuation warnings in their orchard home area as the Clark Fork River continues to tear through Missoula if you're interested in an emergency shelter um, uh, Christ the King Church, 1400 Gerald Avenue in Missoula. You can call them at 258-INFO, 258-4636. Again, that number is 258-4636 for more information about shelter or if you're on an evacuation warning and you need a place to go. Okay, fl flows at the river uh, gauge upstream from Missoula put the water level at 13 feet yesterday afternoon. The National Weather Service predicts flows could crest at 13.5 feet by Saturday below Missoula where the Bitterroot and Clark Fork, F Clark Fork converged. The water was flowing close to 50,000 cubic feet per second, which is close to five times daily medium at the time during the past 88 years. So this has been the first time in the last 88 years that this is going five times faster. Th okay, temperatures are expected to drop into the 50s today. We'll bounce back into the 70s by Monday. According to Ray Nichols, how do you a uh, hydrologist with the National Weather Service in Missoula. The water levels could drop slightly, but he's expected them to start climbing again next week. In Montana news, if you're interested in kind of getting uh, way out of Montana, even further out of Montana, you can learn from Montana astronaut Lauren Acton will be doing a, will be the keynote spoke speaker at Helena's College um, commencement ceremony, where 230 students will receive certificates or degrees. Um, Acton is a physicist who flew on the space shuttle mission in 1985 as a payload specialist. Acton was born in Fergus County, attended high school in Billings, and graduated from Montana State College in 1959 with a degree in engineering physics. The ceremony, ceremony will take place at ex Exhibition Hall at the Lewis and Clark County Fairgrounds at 11 a.m. in Helena uh, Saturday with a reception to follow. In national news, so Homeland Security is sticking by their guns. Uh, about keeping families separated who have crossed Mexican-American border, but it's been a little more highlighted on the NPR.org article. Um, Homeland Security Christian Nielsen defended the administration's zero tolerance policy, calling that separating families who cross the border illegally, saying that the undocumented immigrant shouldn't get special treatment. Uh, Department of Homeland Security will begin referring uh, for prosecution. Anyone will referring for prosecution anyone it catches trying to enter the United States unlawfully immigrant advocates criticize the announcement saying it's cruel to separate children from their parents um, and that's kind of what's happening in the news uh, more recently um, I got uh, some art clips for you guys this is a brand new art clip from the clay studio of Missoula which will be playing until May 25th so we have a um, couple more couple uh, shows with this and then when I come back I'll have Hayden Groats on to talk about bike for shelter from the Washington Children's Shelter <laughs>
Hey guys, we're back here with Hayden Groats, and she's here to talk about Bike for Shelter, which is happening May 19th from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Community, Community Medical. You got it. So that's all that, but you work for Washington's Children's Shelter, and yes. this is your annual uh, fundraising event as well. Yep. So what can you tell us uh, about um, Washington's Children's Shelter? Yeah, first off, thanks for having us again. Um, for those of you that don't know, Watson Children's Shelter, we're an emergency shelter for children, infants of 14 years old that have been removed from the home for various reasons, uh, many of which are abuse and neglect. Um, unfortunately, we've seen an increase um, of abuse and neglect across the state, and for that reason, um, our services are needed more than ever right now, um, which is why Bike for Shelter is so important to us. Um, this is one of our annual fundraisers for the shelter that help us to do all the fun things that we do with the kids. So, yeah. Great. And what kind of activities are you guys going to have at Bike for Shelter? Yeah. So, Bike for Shelter, um, we there's two bike rides. So, there's an 11-mile bike ride and a two-mile bike ride for little kids. Um, there's a big carnival. We'll have... Um, face painting, there's costume contest. Um, two things that I'm really excited about this year that are new are battle balls, Ooh. which is like those big uh, rubber balls that you put over yourself and run into your friends. <laughs> and then there's the bungee run where you strap up to bungees and you and your friends run as fast oh. as you can in the same direction. And yeah, bounce houses, um, you name it. We were gonna have a lot of it. pony rides. It's really wow. fun. Yeah, it's super fun. And a lot of this goes to good causes. Yes. Um, what is a Washington, I mean, you've been working with Washington's Children's Shelter for a couple of years now. Yes. And yep. what is a Washington Shelter, in your opinion, uh, brought to the community? What have we brought to the community? Um, well, we provide safe housing for children. Um, like I said, so, um, so often the children, there's problems at home or it's not safe for them to be at home and we're able to provide them a place to call home um, in the meantime and hopefully get them um, and their families help that they need and then reunite them with their families after that. So we do f all sorts of fun activities with them over the summer. Um, we get them enrolled in school. We take them to doctor's appointments, stuff like that. And so that's so many of the children. We've been full for the most part of five years. Wow. And we've got two houses. Um, one of them is on Buckhouse Lane. Um, that houses 16 children, and they're all school-aged. And then we've got our Fort House location, um, and that's got all of our little kids, and there's about eight kids that live there. So always full. We've got 24 kids now, so yeah. Yep. So uh, what, uh, what do you guys have an initial goal of how much you want to raise? Well, this event raises about 10% of our fundraising budget. So we fundraise um, over $600,000 every single year. So this is a big chunk of that. So wow. we encourage everybody from the community uh, to come out and support the event. It's awesome. Cool. Yeah. And um, a lot of this money goes to maintaining the Washington Children's Shelter? Um, it goes to um, doing activities with the children um, most of that is like like summer for example oh, yeah. we've got a super extensive summer program we go on camping trips oh. to Glacier we go um, to Virginia City to do gold mining um, swim lessons all summer long um, things that many of the kids have never done before um, and we try to give them those experiences while they're with us so yeah so, uh, one, so let's let's talk about your website okay, uh, WashingtonChildrenShelter.org is where you can find more information about uh, Washington Shelter and Shelter yep. and the 18th annual Bike for Shelter. Yes, we, uh, so you can register online until May 16th um, and then you can register at the event. The price will increase so make sure you do that beforehand. Um, and then there's volunteer opportunities on there. Um, you can read about all about our sponsors. Um, Montana Rail Link is our premier sponsor. Wow. They've been with us for 18 years. They do an awesome bar barbecue for us at the events, so make sure you come and eat uh, all the stuff that they make for us. Uh, yeah, we've got awesome supporters, so really fun event. Everybody should come out for it. Cool. Yeah. So um, once again, um, letting you guys know is that on May, 8, May 19th, which is a week from tomorrow, yes, is the Washington Children's Shelter Bike for Shelter yes. from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Is there anything else you'd like to say? No, I think that's all. Just uh, hope to see you all there. All right. Thank cool. you for joining me. Thanks so much, Scott. Stay with me. I got plenty of uh, new programs going to be airing on MCAT um, starting this weekend. So here they are. Sexuality is just a really fun topic. We could spend hours and days and weeks talking about it. It's not simple. It doesn't fit in a round, round peg, round hole. Um, so, oh God, is that? Anyway. <laughs>
part. Um, it's extremely complex. Thankfully, if I have somebody who I'm working with and they're attracted to children, but they're also attracted to adults, then let's focus there, please. Um, and it's not deviant to be attracted to juveniles. Why? Why is it not deviant to be attractive? I didn't say act out on it. Please don't go do that. Um, but it's not deviant. Why we don't consider? Because they can reproduce. Secondary <laughs> sexual characteristics, <laughs> right? Yes. Adolescents <laughs> have <laughs> secondary sexual characteristics. Lips, breast developing, facial hair, body hair, deepening of voices. It is not deviant. How many of us have, well, I shouldn't say us, but how many men and or women have been driving down the street and you see a car wash and you go, whoa, and then you go, Oh, it's the high school freshman cheerleading team. Ah, not deviant. <laughs> to show, you know, to get, limit people's access on, in front of his property. And, and every day, when people get on that river during the permitted season, someone from DFWP is probably interacting with them. Um, and so, probably, I, you know, I would consider advising that person, why don't you talk to DFWP? Why don't you get them? Maybe they could do something more effective for you than, you know, trying to protect your property with fences and signs and all that. And they could they can educate recreationalists for you. Why don't you consult with DFWP and see in the past what have other landowners done? You know, what are, is there is is there something that could be done just for you know for this situation? Um, so that's an important part in the rule, you know, in the comments of the rule that's included to um, direct your clients to, to consult with other professionals. And so that's probably what you should be doing if you're representing a landowner. Uh, I think it's, it's worth pointing out that if these executive orders were put forth by our previous presidents, there's a pretty good chance that they wouldn't be struck down in court. So uh, I shouldn't even disagree with me. I don't know if that's true, my numbers are true, but what's really problematic for the Trump administration is that Trump tweeted a lot, and he, uh, his senior administration officials you know, said a lot of things that were essentially just made very clear that the purpose of these executive orders was to just simply keep Muslims out of the United States. And uh, the Immigration and Naturalization Act um, and the U.S. Constitution sort of forbid any policy uh, that's just backed by discriminatory animus, even if you say that it's for national security reasons. But the president has a lot of power to keep people out of the United States. Um, but one thing you can't do is announce that I'm doing this because I don't like Muslims, and that's exactly what Trump did. Hey guys, welcome back. I'm going to add that little uh, tagline at the very end of Missoula's Community Media Resource of every uh, media assistant grant um, promotional video for MCAT from now on. I just thought to it, I was like, yeah, this probably needs a nice little plug, so I decided just to do that. Anyways, whew, let's talk about some uh, movies that are coming out this weekend. It's time for pre-critic. Starting off, are you the life of the party? Wherever you go, good for you. 
Or, uh, I'm sorry. Um, let me guess. Melissa McCartney is back with yet another movie where she goes to a place where she doesn't belong. Only to learn the ways of college girls this time. Uh, the sequel should be Life of Debt. Am I right? Um, anyways, Life of the Party is out in theaters, and like most Melissa McCartney and McCarthy movies, they'll have their charm and fun like anyone who likes the idea of a female Chris Farley. Up next, we got, like those movies that flip the script comes breaking in, a movie about a woman who decides, you know what, I'm not going to let these guys uh, mess with me anymore, so I'm going to flip the script. I don't even know if she actually says it. Could you imagine if she actually says it in the movie? But yeah, pretty much this is a home invasion movie. Um, it's, so, it's so lazy that the synopsis reads this. A woman fights to protect her family during a home invasion. End quote. I'm um, assuming she fights them off and everyone uh, lives a little bit happier as a result. Maybe there's an ex-husband who is threatening to take her kids away and ends up dead in the process. Or maybe he uh, ends up trying to save the family and the mother's like, I'll give you a second chance. And it's like, we're stronger as a family because of this experience we live together. And that's basically the movie. Uh, the next movie is, do you like it when famous comedic actors from the 90s come back in a serious role? Because let's face it, their humor chops relied on cheap um, humor like stunts and f Pratt Falls. Chris Pratt, I mean Chris, Jim Carrey, not Chris Pratt, Jim Carrey's uh, is an old and um, is committing dark crimes or he's solving dark crimes. Or this is a movie just uh, named so you don't know and I think it's coming out on Netflix which is uh, basically the highbrow Hallmark channel right now. Uh, of course, uh, can't wait to see uh, Will, Arnett, Will Arnett make a cameo appearance in this movie. And that basically concludes all the movies that are coming out. I have a brand new uh, short film for you guys from Washington Middle School. And this is the last one from Washington Middle School um, that I have for Flagship Friday, but I got plenty of Hellgate High School, I got plenty of CS Porter, and I got plenty of Lowell. So stay with me. Um, coming up next, I'm going to be talking about the Max Wave Project in uh, the city of Missoula, which has been kind of... Uh, um on the sidelines for uh, at least a year. I haven't heard too much about the Max Wave in a while, but it's coming back to the Missoula. So learn more after this Flagship Friday video. Man, that test was hard. Hell, my What time do you know? Uh, I'll tell you another time. I don't worry about any tests. As long as I've gotten my uh, new trusty spoon. Dude, you've used that spoon since first grade. Why do you not just throw it away? What's wrong with that kid, the weird spoon guy? Oh, he's a weird leech creature thing. He's like, he latches and he leeches and you get stuck with him. As long as it doesn't latch on me, I'll be fine. Um, he's got a spoon thing. What's your spoon thing? What's that supposed to mean? I mean, no offense, but everyone here has a, a thing going on and me, sweaters, they call me Sweater McShady. Something like that. I don't really care anymore. I care, my parents call me shameless because I don't really have any shame, but they're ashamed of me. Can I not be a thing? Because I don't like the idea of being labeled. My kid tried to not get a nickname, and now he's called No Nickname McGee. He changed schools. No one really knows what happened since. Well, can I give myself a nickname before it's too late? There might be a way, but it is very, very difficult and dangerous. Follow me, child. I'll show you the way. So, what's your real name? Uh, I don't really remember. Uh, Mordecai. Sorry, I haven't heard it from anyone, not even my parents. Hey, Cotton or Joe? Hell, I draw. Hell, I draw. People call you Cotton or Joe because you have cotton in your ear? Yep. Why don't you just take it out? Don't wreck your eyes at me if I do. 
I felt a pair of pressure. Well, this school sucks because you can't remember each other's names and nicknames. You don't have names here. I'll give you a nickname and send you on your way. So the way you get your nickname is by, is that your, is your real name is by someone calling you your name and they say, stop calling me that and your nickname will be your real name. Oh, that makes sense. Who are you? <laughs> so Hunter McGee, don't you know me? Connie and Joe, don't you know? Nope. Well, I know you. Aren't you the spoon kid? Uh-huh. Oh, where's your spoon? No, oh, no! You're not spooning. You don't have a spoon. You're just a new kid. Better give him a nickname. Yeah. Let me let, let us give you a nickname, okay? Mm, let me think. Uh, Eyebrow Joe? No. Um, uh, fairy Man? Bright Laces? Bright Man. Bright Man. No, no, no. not Brighton. No. no, um, Bright Light Giant? No, no. Bright short Hair. Short Hair Joe. Joe ha short Hair. No, 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 Joe's. Short. Short nose Mo. Short. <laughs> short nose Gopher. Short nose Gopher. Yeah. Short nose Gopher. Or Gopher for short. Yeah. Okay. Hey guys, welcome back. Max Wave is back in the City Council Community of the Whole. They're talking about some of the projects that can be done with the Max Wave. You like Brennan's Wave? That's by Karis Park. Well, now. Um, the Max Wave is a new project that's getting uh, proposed uh, to the city, uh, but there's not much happening in terms of that. Uh, but this is what a lot of this. Uh, um, so let's talk about some of the things that are happening with this um, community of the whole. At Wednesday, community of the whole Max Wave will be di discussed and talked about in terms of planning to make this happen. Uh, they're talking about updates, talking about where it is at now, um, what other side projects will be doing to help uh, revitalize and. Um, basically make the river a much cleaner, more habitable place to live. Because um, there's just a whole bunch of different like sediments and concrete that's actually in there. And a lot of uh, um, sediments and stuff that flow through the river are going downstream. Of course, Brennan's Wave uh, maintenance and the Max Wave projects were last reviewed in um, uh, over three years ago in Committee of the Whole, February 18th, 2015. Uh, volunteers and local nonprofits uh, built the Brennan's Wave Whitewater Park structure in 2006. Mayor Jonigan claims that this project has taken more than eight years to get off the ground and is looking forward to get back on task. So here is John Egan with a couple opening words. Uh, I believe that the project represents a great opportunity for the city of Missoula and for the community. Um, I believe that the, the evidence on the ground in the form of Brennan's Wave suggests there's considerable appetite for a recreational facility like this in the city of Missoula. And I also believe that uh, the byproduct of the recreational facility is uh, improved um, uh, maintenance of uh, these irrigation ditches, which are uh, complications to our river and our community. All right, so um, that was Mayor John Ingen. Uh, there's more of his quotes that I could have used, but I just wanted to um, skip over that part. Um, the next person, Molly Davison, um, she's with the Max uh, Wave Committee since 2013, and she talks about the site where they're going to be building the Max Wave with MAP included. I, I want to describe the existing conditions in a little bit more detail. Um, there's a lot of things going on here. Uh, the irrigators have to get into the, their diversion almost on an annual basis to build up uh, rubble to allow um, the waters to enter their system. They have a water right that they need to access. So they're in the channel quite a bit um, digging up material. Um, you may have seen jersey barriers that they put in the channel to, to hold up the water. There's also quite a bit of concrete rubble uh, that's pointed out in the arrow there. Um, we think, looking back at historical imagery that used to be stacked up as a more tall diversion feature, and over time it's eroded, probably why they're not able to get their water, because it doesn't uh, hold up the water like it used to. All right, so that was Molly Davison, and I just want to uh, basically kind of stay on this picture real quick. Uh, the whole Big Max wave thing is going to be here. And it's um, this area right here will be kind of like the port where they want people to get off and be able to ride the Max Wave around here. Um, but that's uh, it's not only just uh, a project um, that's all about the Max Wave. It's also improving the river's 
ecological system while at the same time maintenance on the Brennan's Way. Um, the, uh, it started off as another Brennan's Wave in the beginning, but turned into a Brennan's Wave maintenance and a waterway recreational site. Not just a wave, added uh, vegetation and many uh, uh, many trees and uh, native plants that they want to be part of the um, original conception. This was an update only item and public comment ends next week for anybody who wants to comment on the Max Wave project. And if you have public comment, you can submit it to uh, Marty Rabine at the City Hall. You can go to ci.mozilla.mt.us. But go, let's go back to the Max Wave. Uh, they want to be able to make uh, two waves, um, a area and then near the California Bridge. So the whole area is kind of like really close to the California Street Bridge, but also a little bit up uh, a little ways towards uh, Russell. So uh, Brian, uh, Brian von Losberg, he reflects on Molly's uh, presentation in terms of dollar amounts uh, for building a new wave. So he's kind of uh, skeptical about how much is this going to cost, and he wants to know the uh, cost assessments to making this uh, max wave a possibility. You know, I'm familiar with the fact that there are wave structures in other states. Colorado has many of them. I'd really like to see. Um, data numbers that are supported by looking at other rivers which is uh, and i appreciate the difficulty of that because of different cfs flow rates and stuff like that but that is um, uh, perhaps a better way to put that is those kind of dollar amounts and the rationale behind those dollar amounts um, i will be scrutinizing uh, and want as much information as possible to justify i've heard uh, what i consider to be thoughtful suggestions around um, sort of endowing uh, a maintenance fund uh, of like 10 percent of um, of a certain amount and again i have no way of knowing um, if those sort of percentages and stuff are tied to reality if, if it should be 40 percent if it should be two percent so so that's it's a heads up all right so that was brian von losberg uh city council member uh for uh rattlesnake here um up next we have um John Harrison, who, who is representing the Salish Kootenai tribe reps who are talking about American Indians' rights to the river. The tribes have been a presence on the river from time immemorial all the way till now. The Milltown Dam removal, uh, the Smurfit Stone remediation and, and cleanup, um, the tribes have been a presence and will continue to be a presence. The main goal of the tribes is to ensure that uh, the tribal members get to continue to utilize the river for their traditional life ways, which they have since time immemorial. Fishing, uh, gathering, uh, utilizing the river. The tribes have always looked to keep the river healthy where it's healthy and restore it where it's not as healthy. So uh, we'll be taking a look at this project as we do with a, with a lot of things. All right. So. Um, that was John Harrison. Um, up next, we got uh, John DeArmond, Science Director, Clark Fork Coalition, talks about what can be done. I, the Max Wave isn't his big goal as much as the Max Wave project, which will help clean up the area site. So this is uh, John DeArmond talking about uh, some of the things that can be done with, uh, along with the Max Wave. Notion that by creating these sort of recreational structures in the urban river corridor, you might relieve pressure on outlying areas, more natural areas, say the ledge at the Blackfoot, by concentrating use in the urban river corridor where it can be effectively managed, uh, you know, trash pickup, safety, health concerns, that sort of thing, and protecting some of our more um, vulnerable places by minimizing the use. And then even within that urban river corridor, right now we have a section of river, say roughly from Karis Park down to the California Street Bridge that doesn't see a lot of use, I think in part because of the kind of degradation we see in the river and that Molly described. And I think this project might help stretch the usable portion of the Clark Fork, for a better, lack of a better way of putting it, down, say, to the California Street Bridge. And we, we think all of that's great, very good, too. All right. So John DeArmond, um, speaking for um, Clark Fork Coalition. Um, there's a lot of concern on the New River over the years from uh, previous projects, and this would not only create a recreational use, but the use would allow for easier access for any future cleanups th that may uh, come around. Of course, uh, John Angen talks about some of the issues in terms of planning and moving forward on this project. 
here is that we don't have a project yet. Um, council doesn't have action to take. I don't have action to take. I don't. Ha I don't have. I don't have a budget to bring you. I don't have a development agreement to bring you. I don't have any of that. So at this point, we're not losing sleep. When the time comes, however, if we get a permit, and if this council is interested in moving forward, then we'll have all sorts of opportunity to talk about a lot of the detail that you heard here today. Development agreement. Um, I have a lot of experience with those, as it turns out, and some of it ain't very good. And so I'm going to be very concerned about what we do in terms of maintenance and also how we burden staff in terms of maintenance. It is most likely that, that Parks and Recreation staff would be responsible for that maintenance. Um, but until the time comes, we don't know. All right. So that was Mayor John Ingen talk about this. Um, it's uh, not uncommon for uh, projects to be done but then the maintenance afterwards to not be covered. So um, it's at this point, if you build it, they will come, but who will come to clean up is what I'm gonna leave you on for Committee of the Whole. Let's talk about some land use and planning stuff. Land use and planning was talking about some of their Title 20.85, which basically means a series of amendments addressing several clarifications are intended to streamline some processes to your conditional use requests and improve town how townhome exemption dev developments. Following this information update, staff will present a specific proposed amendments along with comments received by the uh, overview of the planning board recommendation amendments. Public hearing is June 4th. Um, I will not be here for that because my vacation starts for the first couple weeks of June. So, um, but the biggest thing I wanna talk about is the university district and they have a large building that that was created across from Bonner Park. I'm not gonna. I don't know who lives there. All I know is that the um, university neighborhood people were very angry and very concerned. Um, more than a hundred people signed a petition um, to ha have the city do some changes when it comes to exemptions and um, dealing with the AKA McMansion problem. Um, and here is Tom Zavitt. Missoula Developmental Services talks about the people who are building maximum size required housing. So here is Tom Zavitz with Developmental Services. Houses are typically built within a building envelope on a parcel. Over time and historically, those sort of footprints for those buildings have been about maybe a, a quarter or a third of the allowed building envelopes. And that's just how things were done over time. That's how architects placed buildings on parcels and they rarely took up the entire building on envelope. The envelope sort of acted like a uh, minimum for setbacks and it provided it, you know, a space to build the building. Well, over time, people have begun to, and I'm gonna show you another 3D picture of that building envelope because height comes into play as well. Um, over time, people have begun to fill the envelope with a structure and, or come close to filling it, and that's happened a couple of times in the university district, at least a couple of times recently, and uh, those houses don't fit the uh, character of the neighborhood. All right, the character of the neighborhood is the biggest thing is, and that's the uh, the the big quote of a lot of university uh, neighborhoods um, concerns is that it doesn't fit the look of the neighborhood. And um, on one side, anybody uh, can do what they want with their property because it's their proper it's their private property. But of course, when uh, over 100 people in the university area are showing concern, real change is being considered. So Jeff uh, Berkby, University Neighborhood Leadership Committee, thinks this won't deter people's architectural design if they're able to limit uh, the size of these buildings. He wants to be able, he wants to uh, basically say that people who move to the university neighborhoods can build their dream home just as long as it fits a certain size requirement. I think that's the only thing that they want to do in terms of that. So here is Jeff. This is a very thoughtful, crafted, well-designed approach to recognize the neighborhood character of the university district without adding burdensome regulation. The proposed overlay is very gentle. It doesn't restrict housing styles or architectural freedom or choice of building materials. It simply addresses overall mass, height, and setback. These three areas are easily addressed 
if the homeowner and builder are educated on the new overlay design when it is passed, and they can then address the protocol in their design prior to construction. It's common sense design element. All right, common sense design element. Um, one of the things that um, Chris Shitty um, voice is his opposition um, um, in terms of this, because he's an architect, architect um, builder here in Missoula, um, who believes that this is just uh, one regulation after one regulation that has a tendency to add up into a big regulation. Uh, I, I, more times than I would like to admit, we end up getting stymied by unintended consequences of very good meaning regulation. And so I just want everybody when they go through this process to have a lot of humility for uh, the unknown unknowns, for, for not knowing what the possible consequences are going to be 10, 20, 30 years into the future. The, the, the ecosystem of regulations that we navigate every day ha was built up one by one, uh, light touch after light touch after light touch. And uh, in the end, they accrete into a, a heavy touch and sometimes a burden. And sometimes they create perverse incentives that um, that do exactly the opposite of what they were intended. Um, All right. So uh, once again, that was Mike uh, Chitty. Um, this continues into next week uh, with a lot of support for this zoning, but city will address some of these issues in the next land use and planning meeting. Public safety and health is another meeting I'm going to go right into. There's a lot of meetings. There's a lot of stuff happening, um, but this is one thing that I think is very important, especially in um, – the safety of students in high schools and great um, in MCPS, Missoula County Public Schools. Mark Thane um, joins uh, the Public Safety and Health to give an update about some of the outside social services that they are providing their students to help support their students in any potential uh, risk uh, assessment situation. So here is um, Mark Thane. We all know that uh, mental wellness uh, doesn't begin when somebody becomes an adult. Uh, we need to address that proactively uh, with the students we serve. Uh, we also have project success counselors in each of our high schools, and that's uh, to deal with students who are struggling with alcohol and substance issues. And again, that's a contracted service uh, so that we can provide that intervention right on the school site. We have long had a history of social workers in our high schools. Last year, we, uh, for the first time, hired social workers for our three middle schools. Again, the effort to connect those families who may need intervention with the local community resources to provide that support and uh, that connection not only with the school but with community services. All right, so that was Superintendent Mark Thane for MCPS. Um, many people have stated that it's easier to teach a child than fix a broken adult. And with many issues in place for some students who struggle and MCPS is unable to localize a specific warning side that can prevent things like Sandy Hook and this year's Florida shooting, um, a police officer is stationed, police officers, plural, uh, are stationed at MCPS schools to help keep security and help with events like school s hosts large amounts of people and students for like sporting events and the stuff and that. Uh, Gwen Jones reflects on um, what principal at Sentinel has done to help uh, secure safety in schools. So here's Gwen Jones. A few weeks ago I read the article about what Ted Fuller was doing at Sentinel where as principal he was encouraging kind of a culture of inclusiveness and they had certain activities they did and I, I, I thought it was great and I think in this era it's important to try anything and everything so that hopefully nothing bad ever happens in Missoula but I'm wondering your thoughts on that if it's being discussed with other schools the approach that he's taking it is kind of personality based and I can totally see him leading a pep rally at Sentinel doing this um, is there any data out there that that this helps. I'm just curious because I thought it was that was a good move. Yes, and actually we are undertaking similar activity in all of our schools. We have our principals meeting once a week in what we call a PLC, a professional learning community, and that's been the foundation where those kinds of activities have been discussed. And again, the uh, significant emphasis on safe and inclusive school environments. Um, there are a number of different initiatives. Some are school specific, some are district specific, but that will continue to be an area of emphasis uh, for us. 
again, uh, as I referenced earlier, what Dr. Fuller's been doing at Sentinel is an outgrowth of the Sentinel planning with their MBI team, the Montana Behavioral Initiative. And each school now has sent a team, and we actually go to Bozeman for a week in the summer for the training, uh, and the team plans together and takes that plan back to their building to start uh, implementing those practices and those lessons and those common expectations. And All right, so um, I'm going to cut them off right there real quick. Um, one of the biggest things that a lot of schools are trying to do is build a sense of community within the schools to kind of help dictate the people's comings and goings. So if you have somebody who is regularly there every week, of course, you know, there it's perfectly fine when you see a person walking through and um, doing that thing. But if you have somebody who uh, has a tendency to be in the area, um, just like wanders around the school grounds and you're kind of concerned, a lot of times it, it helps to uh, report any kind of um, shady people or any incidents where you don't recognize a certain person who's go coming to your school. And a lot of times um, it's not enough for the person at the front window to kind of stop every single person. So a lot of times it's up to the students, the faculty and the staff to work together, which is why they have this built in inclusiveness, community building thing for each school to help move that forward. So here's Chief Mike Brady. He speaks on protecting students with the uh, five officers that he has uh, stationed within the schools. Well, years ago when we didn't have officers assigned to the schools, the response to any, any concerns at the schools was just a patrol officer being dispatched to that call. A different officer every time. Um, and what we've developed now is, is these outstanding working relationships with the staff and the same officers working the schools every day have the knowledge of what's going on. They have the knowledge of who's supposed to be there, who isn't supposed to be there, and, and the connections to the school to immediately identify someone who we need to pay attention to or, or we need to go out and find out why they're there. All right, so that was uh, City uh, of Missoula Chief Mike Brady of Missoula uh, City Police Department. MCPS has a very good uh, uh, about being clear and open to the public about their methods to protecting their students in the schools. Biggest thing law enforcement asks that if you report anybody who may be entering your schools from off the street or folks who visit the school without a clear purpose of visit. Uh, Mark Thane answers uh, the million dollar question of arming teachers. I think it's really difficult to anticipate the level of stress that one would experience in an emergency situation and to not have the consistent appropriate training to respond, I think has the potential to put students and other staff members at risk. Yeah, I would agree with you. All right, so uh, that was, uh, I mean, that was kind of talked about a little bit more in the media as well. Um, one of the things that uh, they kind of were uh, mentioning as well is that um, with high pressure situations, kind of like what happened at Big Sky a couple months ago when a uh, somb uh, somebody in a car tried to run over a police officer and the, uh, the police officer had to um, basically uh, shoot his weapon in that uh, at the car. So that was one of the um, news articles that was happening in the past. Uh, but of course, being proactive uh, usually means uh, de-threatening the schools, which means uh, locked doors, funneling visits to the school, make sure that all uh, visiting parties go through the same door and out the same door. Public safety and health tend to be more informational only, so you can find out more information at the public safety and health meeting by going on to ci.missoula.mt.us. Those meetings and more is a great way for you to get involved with the city of Missoula. You can watch those meetings and you can uh, click on the topics that you wish to listen about because sometimes if there's a zoning request, you don't want to hear about uh, some um, business or something that's uh, going to be popping up and they just want to ask about a certain sign size. So it's a good way to find um, exactly what you need to find in that information. So ci.missoula.mt.us. If you want to learn more information about MCAT, I just want you to have a, a couple more MCAT-related news items. You go to MCAT.org. MCAT.org is your source for everything MCAT. We are looking for people to take our survey. We have a survey, and we want to know, hey, do you have charter cable? Tell us what you think. 
tell us what you think about Charter Cable. Charter Cable is the uh, cable company that allows MCAT to be on television on channel 189 and 190. So we get franchise fee negotiation, so we get money that comes from the gross profit from Charter. So basically, it's a, it's a in a way, it's an enterprise fund from the uh, city of Missoula who regulates it. They give us about a percentage, and they keep a percentage for in ma basic improvements and maintenance and stuff like that. But it's uh, a lot of good that is given to this uh, community and uh, to allow us to go out and shoot uh, many different um, venues and many different events that happen in Missoula to basically kind of document Missoula's history in real time. But I just want you guys to know that MCAT also provides an education opportunity for kids age 9 to about 18. If you have a kid in school, um, they can do our summer camps. So I want you guys to know that our animation camp number 2, which is happening in uh, July, I believe that's going to be the, uh, the week after July 4th week, and that's going to be happening. Um, we have 10 kids, so we only have two more spots available. We have 12 spots for each of our camps. We have a zombie camp, we have two animation camps, so if you can't get into the second animation camp, sign up for our first animation camp, which basically runs from uh, the 25th um, until the 24th, I believe, 20 no wait, 25th to the 24th, what am I talking about? 25th, 26th, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, so 25th <laughs> to the 29th. Uh, our first animation, our first camp of the summer, and then of course we have Time Travelers Camp, which is going to be a lot of fun because it's a brand new camp, and we're going to be teaming up with the Historic Museum at Fort Missoula. So I got art clip for you from our very own Rick Phillips, and this is going to be happening all the way through our summer camps until July 28th, and this is, I believe, at the Missoula Art Museum. So here is the shape of things. New Approaches of Indigenous Abstraction. And this is going to be at the uh, Missouri Art Museum until the end of July. So stay with me. I got events right after this. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back. Thanks to our very own Rick Phillips for providing that wonderful art installation piece. Um, he films uh, a lot of the art museums. If you have an art I opening, art installation that you want MCAT to film, you must be a nonprofit and a nonprofit or uh, education facility. And um, basically, you can't be attempting to <laughs> sell a lot of your art unless it goes to a good cause. So if you want us to cover that, you can contact that contact us at 542-6228, otherwise known as 542-MCAT. I think it's a nice little highlight of art. A lot of times it was like taking a picture of art kind of takes away from the art, but I think it, it's a good way to kind of capture the art that was there at the time because a lot of times when you see art at an art museum, you don't see it a lot later on. So <laughs> um, let me think for a second here. Starting right now at the Ranch Club, the JJM Golf Tournament is a to support Juvenile Justice Ministry in Missoula. 100% all fees go to support the mentorship of teens in Juvenile Hall. And that's what's happening today at 9 a.m. And it's pretty much uh, the uh, JJM Golf Tournament. Family fun time. Um, Mismo, Misa, and 
Roots Acker Sports Center. So uh, Misa is uh, Missoula Indoor Sports Arena. It's all sorts of family fun time to enjoy some indoor activities for kids. And why not? It's raining outside. Um, Tiny Tales and Storytime is a great way to stay indoors and read. So um, they must a kid must be accompanied by an adult lap at the Missoula Public Library starting at 10.30 a.m. Kids age birth to five years of age. It's a great way to get kids exposed to books, and kids learn nine new words a day, according to the Public Library, MissoulaEvents.net page. Um, workplace resilience for pr providers. Uh, the Learning Center at Red, Will Red Willow offers classes and many different opportunities, and this is a uh, class with his uh, workplace resilience pr for providers, and this is going to be taught by Kathy Mangan. Um, and it happens every Friday starting today and going through July 6th. It's $200. It's uh, from 11 to 1 p.m. It's an eight-week course. This course will provide the tools that help people in the moment, both on the job and on the ongoing basis off the job, to increase the ability to um, for an emotional, for uh, auto-regulate emotional, and to decrease physiological hyperrosal. Um, these are two aspects of trauma resiliency. These proven tools are borrowed from the many different areas of psychotherapy, gathering a tool uh, into a tool trust and taught over a specific amount of time to allow participants to experience and pr practice them and to come back with questions. All the tools require um, consistent practice to be of optimal use in the times of crisis, which is why practice is so important. And this course is being approved for 14 CEs for mental health providers. So if you're a mental health provider and you want to increase um, and de-stress any situations in your life and other people's lives, this is a great class to do at the Learning Center at Red Willow starting at 11 every single Friday until July. Animal Habitat Spectrum Discovery Center is hosting a s uh, science in ab animal habitat, uh, today's scientist of the day is Petrus Camper. Um, yarns and watercolor is at the Missoula Public Library starting at noon today. If you like yarns and you like to stitch and make your own clothes and maybe knit a sweatshirt, maybe knit a scarf in time for Mother's Day this weekend, it's a great place to be, the Missoula Public Library. But if it's full, maybe you can do a watercolor uh, of your mom. Um, <laughs> and all this is at the Missoula Public Library starting at 12. Mother's Day weekend special, Lolo Hot Springs. Mother's is doing a uh, two-day stay in an RV site and get the third day free. Reservations at 406-273-2294. Um, it's at the Lolo Hot Springs. So it's a great Mother's Day weekend if you want to take your mother and spend uh, three nights with your mother <laughs> in Lolo Hot Springs. Check it out. Great. Uh, Teen Writers Group is a Missoula Public Library at 3.30 p.m. this afternoon. Improve your writing skills or just improve your creative writing in general at the Missoula Public Library starting at 3.30 right after school. Hey, Harley-Davidson, hey, it's uh, the weather may not be great now, but the weather is going to get nicer this summer. And if you want to pick up a nice big hog, um, you can learn to ride. A Harley-Davidson Riding Academy is starting at the Grizzly Harley-Davidson. Um, when you take a new riding course in the Riding Academy, you'll learn to ride a genuine Harley-Davidson motorcycle. You get in-class and on-range instruction from Motorcycle Safety Foundation, HD um, certificate coaches, learn the safety accelerate, shift, brake, and turn along with maneuvers like controlling skids and uh, surmounting obstacles. And you can earn a MSF basic riding course uh, um, completion card, which may exempt you from writing portion of your license exam and score you a discount on motorcycle insurance. So this is, uh, all you got to do is go to grizzlyhd.com to learn more about the Grizzly Riding Academy. So the third annual uh, Ceramics Invitational is going to be at the uh, Radius Gallery. Radius Gallery is a wonderful place with a lot of mixed art and a lot of great artists that are going to be on there as well. It's the third, an third annual Ceramics Invitational featuring artwork by almost an endless amount of artists on there. I, 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 I don't want to say all their names because there's like 30 names on here. So you can check that out starting at 5 p.m. tonight. Family Friendly Friday from 6 to 9 p.m. Our very own employee here, Jack Catmull, son of Tom Catmull, um, is doing a band thing with his band, Carpool, at the Top Hat. So you can check that out. It's going to be great. But if you're not going to do that, the MCT's The Little Mermaid is playing at 7.30 tonight. It's the last weekend to check it out. So your last chance to enjoy under the sea. All right, so that's basically all your things for Friday. Uh, if you guys are going out even further, um, they got Dead Hipster, Dance Party, I love the 90s, so if you like love 90s music, I hate it, you can go to the Bell Under. 
Gladys Friday is going to be mus miscellaneous music, so a bunch of uh, fun um, live dance music. Um, Union Club is the place to be. Um, let's see. Let's talk about some Saturday stuff. I'm going to skip right over the Saturday. Oh, crap. I'm out of time. I have about four minutes left in the show, so I can quickly go over Saturday. Farmer's Market from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. All sorts of great Clark Fork River Market, um, Farmer's Market, the OG Market, and, of course, the People's Market all happening in downtown Missoula. You can't miss it. Just go downtown Missoula, walk around a little bit, enjoy some day, enjoy the day. It's going to probably, I don't know, it probably won't be as wet, but it'll probably be kind of cloudy tomorrow, but it'll be fine. It's fine. You know, I've been to the farmer's market way worse. So, let her carry your food drive. The annual NALC National Associ Associ Association of Letter Carriers food drive is on Saturday, May 12th, tomorrow. Leave any non-perishable goods in and at your mailbox for your mail carrier to collect. All donations will stay at our local food bank. Um, yeah, so it's as easy as um, putting your food in your mailbox and flipping up the. Uh, the little flag, and the letter carriers will take this food to the food bank. You can take that to the bank. Anyways, Silver Auto Auction at the Missoula Fairgrounds. Annual event at the Missoula County Fairgrounds is from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. The classic sale of um, Collect Your Automobiles is happening all day. If you want more information, you can go to silverauctions.com. Volunteer tree planting in Lolo. Hey, tree planting is awesome. And why not? Go near Fort Fizzle. Volunteer planting in Lolo. Lolo Watershed Group is seeking volunteers for a massive planting effort near Fort Fizzle, outside of Lolo. This event will take place over two weekends, starting this weekend and next weekend from 9 to 5, and they will focus, they will more focus on the first weekend, and of course they'll have, they'll probably have a little less trees on the second weekend, but this weekend is the place to, do to be. Um, it's four hour shifts, um, but you can, st you don't have to stay the whole day, you can stay for part of the day. You're planting trees, and they want. I think they want to plant over 3,000 trees in Fort Fizzle. Superhero Saturday. Um, I got a couple more. I got a minute. So Missouri Museum is having a Superhero Saturday, fa Saturday family free workshop at the Missouri Art Museum starting at 11 a.m. MCAT Saturday drop-ins are from 1 to 5. Um, this weekend and next weekend are our last weekends here at MCAT, so you can join us for Saturday drop-ins on those weekends as well. So Simplify is going to be at Mask Studio for Arts and Above at the Mask Studio. Um, it's going to be contemporary dance at Mask Studio, 7.30 p.m. And if you're interested in doing some late night events tonight, you can go to Call of the Corpse, BFW, absolutely, with DJ music at the Badlander, Joan Zen at Union Club, uh, Rotgut Wines, an album release party at the Top Hat Lounge. And that pretty much does it for everything MCAT related. Well, not, that's not even MCAT related. That's for everything Missoula related. So if you want to learn more information, go to Wake Up Missoula. .wixsite.com slash wake up Missoula is the nice free major ride out twice. MCAT.org for more information about our public access station. And for MCAT, I'm Scott Ramp. Have a good wake up Missoula weekend, people.